I'll ease into this very quietly, okay? We always forget something. Good morning on this beautiful summer day. I'd like to welcome you to the joint worship service of First Congregational United Church of Christ and Christ United Methodist, where we have been blessed and ministered in this shared facility for almost 40 years. Is that remarkable? Yes. I've got a few announcements to make. Uh, one is we are strongly encouraging folks to wear masks during worship, as this latest variant is quite infectious, and we've had some folks including dear Pastor Don, uh, get COVID in the last week. And masks are available in the narthex if that you would like to do that. Um, are there any other announcements for either Christ United or First Congregational? Okay. Um, could you flip? A few weeks ago, I talked about the UCC Church in Red Lodge and the community of Red Lodge and surrounding areas and they're moving forward in their flood recovery effort. And I just wanted to update you all. Uh, Pastor Pam shared with, well actually the picture on the left is their basement and they're just blowing lots and lots of air through it, pulled up carpet sheet, rocking the whole bit, getting every bit of damp out so they don't have mold issues. And that's where they have coffee hour and all the good church basement activities. To the right is the church sponsors or has a community preschool. That's not just a Sunday school room, but it's an actual community preschool. And so the sheetrock got torn up. You can see how high the water's got. And of course, the industrial fans going. So that's just an update. As recovery efforts move forward, needs change, uh, Pam did share with me uh, the help is now needed for people who can drywall, yard recovery, and ch child care for recovery effort workers. Uh, if you know someone or if you can help, please let me know, and I can put you in contact with Pastor Pam for their needs. But they are moving forward, and it will be an ever-evolving situation. And this little church is just representative of that whole region. So continued prayers for them. Any other announcements? I'd like to thank Laura Dietrich. Where did she go? Our soloist this morning. I don't know if you're here to hear her rehearse, but hold on to your hats because it's beautiful. Jean. Wonder that's a big deal. Thank you, Christ United Methodist. So we got air conditioning up in Fellowship Hall. So let us settle into our time of worship. Let us collect our thoughts and our hearts and our minds. The one who is holy and righteous makes us holy and righteous. We are participants, heirs, and co-creators of new life found in the redemptive love of Jesus Christ and the realm of the Holy One, which has no end. In this grace abounds and liberates us to new mornings, new mercies, and new life. Jesus taught us to be persistent in prayer, the life of the baptized to be rooted and built up in Christ Jesus is to be nurtured by prayer. God hears and answers prayer and so strengthens God's own. As the psalmist proclaims, when I called, you answered me. You increased my strength within me. My friends, welcome to worship. We gather to rejoice in the Holy One. Oh. So, okay. We'll gather to rejoice in the Holy One. <laughs> so 
We assemble as people called to community by and with the Redeemer. We come open to the possibilities made new by the Creator. Almighty and ever living God, you are always more ready to hear than we are to pray. And you gladly give more than we are. Pour us upon us your abundant mercy. Forgive us those things that weigh on our conscience, and give us those good things that come only through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. And please stand for our first hymn, Blessed Assurance, number 473, in the Black New Century Hymnal. Please be seated. All righty, Caden knows the drill. Come on, young folks. Time for the children's sermon. Now, do you remember a couple of minutes ago we were looking at the pictures up on the screen of all the different ways to pray? Do you remember? Do you remember that, Leah? You remember that, Caden? What we're sent now. Our scripture this morning. Mm-hmm. There's lots of different ways to pray. And one of the ways we pray is we do things with our hands. Do you remember what some of those pictures showed of what we do with our hands when we pray? Do you remember, Aaliyah? What was one of them? Aaliyah. Aaliyah, sorry. What was, yeah. What was one of the ways they did with their hands? Do you remember? Did they do this? Yeah. And then there was a lady doing this. And there was another lady doing this. 
And why do they think, why do you think people put their hands and arms out like that when they pray? What do you think, Caden? It's a way to converse with God. That's exactly right. And Christians, we tend to pray that way, but there's also, there are some couple of other pictures up there. One is um, a man who's a Muslim. And they pray, I think they pray all the time, but they pray definitely five different times a day. And they pray by kneeling down and bending down towards God. And our Catholic friends pray they have a thing called a rosary, and it's got a cross and beads on it, and that way they can keep track of their prayers. And some Jewish people, when they... Kind of like those prayer chains we made back then. Kind of like the prayer chains we made. That's exactly right, so we can remember our prayers. And Jewish people, you'll see pictures of them in Jerusalem. They rock back and forth. That's how they pray. I brief birthday celebration for my sister here. Okay, we'll talk about birthdays in just a minute, okay? So, do you think there's just one way to pray? What do you think? Definitely way more than one. Definitely way more than one way to pray, and that's right. And our scripture this morning was the disciples went to Jesus and said, teach us how to pray. Because they prayed with their tradition they grew up in, but they knew Jesus was something new and different, and he wanted to take, learn from them. So when you pray... You can pray before dinner. When else do you pray? Well, we do pray before dinner, only in like special events during like, fa- like Thanksgiving. Okay. Do you pray at bedtime? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Jesus loves me. Jesus, like, yeah. They do Jesus love, yeah, my parents do Jesus love me, now I lay me, and our Father. Those are good prayers. And we're going to learn more about our Lord's Prayer, our Father in Heaven today too. But you can pray when you're in the car, you can pray when you're at school. You can pray when you're in Sunday, Sunday school or even regular school. So let's pray, okay? Let's do a nice, simple pray. And do whatever, what do you want to do with your hands? You want to do this? Do you, you're good with doing this? You ready, Leah? Do you want to do this too? Okay, let's pray. Oh God. Oh God. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you that you care about every part of our life. And we can go to you with whatever worries us. Amen. Okay, thank you very much.
Our New Testament reading this morning is Luke 11, 1 through 13. Hear the words for us this day. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, and we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, Do not bother me, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened." What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The Old Testament reading this morning is Psalm 138. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart, Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down towards your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul you increased. All of the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord. For they have heard the words of your mouth and they shall sing the ways of the Lord. For great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, and he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. The word of, the word of God for the people of God. Join me in prayer. Holy One, open our hearts and minds to your presence this morning. Let us hear your message for us this morning and let all other words fall away like chaff in the wind. Amen. Luke is my favorite gospel because it's a road map of how to live the kingdom of God on earth today how we can experience what we think all the blessings and good stuff in heaven, we can have those today. Luke tells us it can be ours now. The Gospel of Luke is about life, living fully now, not waiting for something better to come later. And Luke is the road map. Luke is the instruction manual. Because Luke writes about Jesus' caring for others, resulting in practical and spiritual blessings for all involved. Furthermore, and very importantly, Luke's gospel spends more time telling us about prayer 
than any of the other Gospels. And this isn't by accident, because prayer is a starting point for us to live as God intended. A focus of Luke is caring for the poor. In the story of Zacchaeus, the tax collector, who everyone hated, and Zacchaeus knew it, and he hated his life because he had gotten himself trapped working for the Roman Empire against his people. Yet one day, Jesus called him down from the sycamore tree and invites himself to dinner at Zacchaeus' house. And after spending time with Jesus, Zacchaeus experiences the joy of being acknowledged, accepted, and loved just as he is. When Jesus tells him, today salvation has come to, this, to your house, Zacchaeus, and you are God's beloved, and in this life God's grace and abundance is yours, Zacchaeus gave away half his possessions to the poor of his community. And to those he had defrauded, he returned the money fourfold, the amount that he had taken from them. Then Jesus tells the people watching all of this, and to us, two millennia later, all of you who have seen me or read about me spending time and building a relationship with Zacchaeus, accepting him for just who he is, do the same. The gospel tells us of this event, so we will do the same as Jesus did. And if we do, everyone will experience spiritual and tangible healing in their lives right now. Not earning points for when we get to heaven, but today. Because Zacchaeus experienced the gift of love, he was compelled to be generous with his wealth to the community, and all were blessed spiritually and practically. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but keep Zacchaeus in the back of your mind. Let's go back a little bit. When Jesus ascended to heaven, the sense among his followers was he would be returning within their lifetime. But the author of Luke was not so sure about this. He thought it might be wise for the followers of Christ to prepare themselves for the long haul, to do what they can to do father to do, do what they can do further God's work on earth while waiting for Christ to return. And the story of Zacchaeus illustrates how we can further God's work while we continue to wait for Christ's return. Consequently, the Gospel of Luke spends a lot of time on Jesus' teachings to his disciples and the necessity of prayer as we live our lives because we are still in that long haul of living on earth waiting for Christ's return. In addition to the story of Zacchaeus, Luke's gospel includes the stories of Mary and Martha, of Lazarus. It has the parables of the Good Samaritan, the rich fool, the great banquet, the lost sheep and the lost coin, the prodigal son, the rich man and the parable of the widow and the judge, all of which individually are lessons on how to live so we may experience the kingdom of God on earth because anything touched by the presence of God is sacred, which is why throughout scripture, God's people are instructed to live our lives conscience, conscious of the abiding presence of Christ. And that's what the book of Luke does. And where do we find this holy and abiding presence? We find it and experience it in prayer. Jesus prays more in Luke than in any of the other Gospels. Prayer is mentioned at Jesus' baptism and transfiguration. Moreover, Jesus' relationship with his disciples is governed by prayer. He prays before he chooses them, before he questions them about who he is, and before he predicts Peter's denial. And only in Luke do the disciples ask Jesus how to pray. In the Matthew version 
of Jesus teaching the Lord's Prayer. It is part of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus taught great crowds of people, including the disciples, many things, including how to pray. Furthermore, Luke, furthermore, throughout Luke, Jesus encourages the disciples to pray, including in parables not found in other gospels. One of which Anna read this morning about going to the friend at midnight with a need which encourages us to persevere in our prayers. Another one of these parables is of the widow and the unjust judge teaching us to pray always and not lose heart. And the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector where the Pharisee prays loud, boasting prayers and the tax collector prays quietly with repentance and faith of God's mercy. So going to the crux of the matter, The disciples asked Jesus to teach them how to pray because John the baptizer had taught his disciples how to pray. And what's going on here is the disciples knew the traditional Jewish prayers, which were generally adorations and praises of God and doxologies. And a cool fact I want to pass on to you because we sing doxologies this summer Doxology comes from an old Greek word meaning sane glory. I just love that. A doxology is a short hymn or song of praise, which we still practice, and it's practiced in the Jewish tradition. So when we sing a doxology later this morning after the offering, we are saying glory to God. And I learned this preparing the sermon. I thought it was cool. I wanted to share it with you. It doesn't have a lot to do with the theme of the sermon, but it was interesting. It's ever on Trent's Trivial Pursuit, what's doxology mean? You're golden. So, back to the sermon. Jesus' disciples asked for a model of what to pray in addition to the prayers of their tradition. And Jesus taught them to make petitions to God. In other words, to ask God to intervene on their behalf and on behalf of others. We ask for forgiveness and healing and guidance, praying for a parking spot. It's a little iffy. But just by the disciples asking, Lord, teach us to pray, is a beautiful prayer of petition. And perhaps after hearing the Sermon on the Mount early in Jesus' ministry, his disciples have been pondering what they heard that day and wanted to go deeper in their understanding of prayer. And so they asked, teach us to pray. A theme in Luke mentioned earlier is caring for the poor. The Gospel of Matthew discusses caring for those who are poor in spirit. Luke is about caring for the poor in in as those who are economically disadvantaged. When Jesus told the disciples to ask God for their daily bread, he was speaking to an agrarian society who understood an important fact. When the harvest is good, there's enough bread for everyone, even the poor. But in a year of bad harvest, prices go up and the poor eat less and the poorest may go without. Additionally, human behavior is such that when there is less, we tend to cling to what we have and not share with those who have less. We experienced this with the toilet paper debacle during the pandemic, and even more recently with the baby formula shortage. It's human behavior, and we all have the capability to hoard. Yet interestingly, and this is time for another sermon, Hoarding is discussed in Luke with the parable of the rich fool in chapter 12. The Gospel of Luke really is a roadmap for daily living, for those who desire their life to reflect the love of God. The operative word of the Lord's Prayer is the word are. When we ask God to give us each day our daily bread, the word are is significant. It refers to more than just an individual or a few, however that's defined, our family, our congregation, our kind. All are included in the prayer for needing daily bread. Furthermore, bread represents 
not only which sustains us physically, but also creates equitable living, equal access to housing, clothing, employment, education, opportunity. When we pray this prayer, we are asking that all be given what they need to live with dignity. Praying the word are means identifying with those for who abundance is just a dream. And in partnership with God, because of prayer, we determine to see that no one goes without, that we live equitably, understanding there's enough of everything for everyone. The author Caroline Lewis suggests, in all of this you may be thinking that the lesson is we shouldn't pray for our own desires. And I don't think that's the point. What is more natural than to turn to our Creator and Redeemer to express the deepest desires of our hearts. Jesus' approach to prayer suggests that the desire of our hearts ought to be shaped not by the values of our culture or our own interests, but by the principles of the kingdom of God, compassion, peace, justice, freedom, and new life. As we pray in that way, I think we can pray with the confidence that everyone who asks receives. And this doesn't just relate to our spirituality. Part of the Lord's Prayer involves meeting our daily needs and protecting us from trials that may overwhelm us. Jesus assures us that we can pray for all these concerns, knowing that God knows our needs and is already working in every person to bring grace and peace, mercy, love, and new life. Praying the Lord's Prayer as taught by Jesus with the words us and our taking precedence over I and my draws us into the reign of God as already present but not fully realized as on earth as it is in heaven. Moreover, during Jesus' ministry, he made sure that when people came to him, they were fed, physically fed. We have the story of the fishes and the loaves and the wedding at Cana, and all the times Jesus shared a meal with others, especially the Last Supper, Jesus made sure bodies and souls were fed. And we need to pay attention to that. Scripture tells us we shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. In the book of John, Christ tells us he is the bread of heaven meaning if we ask God for the spiritual sustenance to live as Christ taught, it will be provided just by our asking. If we understand God as our daily bread nourishing us, this prayer becomes not just a casual request for food. Christ promised that anyone who hungered would be filled. Furthermore, and very importantly, as we receive and partake of our daily bread for our heart and soul and body, there will be born in us compassion, acceptance, concern, and genuine forgiveness, which each of us needs to receive and give. And this is what Jesus did for Zacchaeus. The author W. Philip Keller tells us, you are what you eat. If we feed our souls and spirits on God's bread from heaven, it follows that is what we shall become. The very life of the risen Christ will reach out through your words and deeds, bringing healing to our world. And it begins with the smallest acts of kindness, such as Jesus sharing a meal with the hurting Zacchaeus. Prayer is powerful. It brings us into the presence of the holy, which the world does not understand. The theologian Judith Plaskow says, the world needs a spiritual solution for our troubles. Because what we have tried with laws, our militaries, and economic theories has not worked. Perhaps if we viewed our troubles and our pain through a spiritual lens, 
if we looked upon ourselves and each other with the kindness of God, with love, love defined as an absence of unkindness, an absence of judgment, as Jesus did with Zacchaeus. And for this to happen, for this to realistically happen, it would have to begin with prayers for our daily bread, asking God to sustain our bodies, our faith, our courage, and patience, so we may all indeed experience God's abundance within ourselves and with one another. The bottom line is, do you believe what Jesus believed about God's love for us? Do you believe what Jesus believed about God's love for us? When Jesus speaks about his divinity, he always makes it known he is the messenger and teacher of something greater. I read this week something by a UCC pastor named Matt Lanny. He really puts it well. He says, I don't recall ever asking anyone to believe in Jesus. I'm more interested in leading people to simply believe him and to believe what he believed. My friends, if you believe in what Jesus taught and how he lived, then do the same. One step at a time, one moment at a time, and one opportunity at a time. And I close with the words from the Kaddish, the oldest and most often spoken prayer in the Jewish tradition. Join me in prayer. May God's kingdom be established in your life and in your days very soon and in the coming season. And all God's people said, amen. And all God's people said, what? There you go.
I could only dream to be able to sing like that. Thank you, Laura. All right, so our time for prayer. Are there any joys and concerns folks would like to share at this time? Yes, ma'am. Bonnie's got a great, brand new great-grandson in Kansas. Nine pounds, 15 ounces. What? and 20 inches long. And his name is Jackson Brooks, and he's going to be a linebacker for the Chicago Bears. Yes, Mr. Caden. Lay is going to have a perfect birthday celebration. I think they're having a mermaid theme. I've already had a mermaid theme last Wednesday birthday party, and I heard she got a bike. Okay, so, so, so praises for Leah's birthday. She turned five, right? Yes. Okay. Yes, Diane Galertner's obituary was in the paper this morning, and the information uh, is there. Also in this morning's paper was the obituary for June Van Coten, who is the mother of Doug Van Coten, who is a member here. He moved to Whitefish a few years ago. So we lift up Doug and his family on the passing of his mother, June. Any other prayers? I keep thinking I see hands. Liz. Prayers for Liz. Prayers for Liz. I have to drive a 26 week call to the Gills in Washington next week. So Wow. Prayers for Liz. She has to drive a fully loaded 26-foot U-Haul to Washington next week. When you're driving, just keep an eye out for a stressed woman going down the interstate. So traveling mercies for Liz. Oh, my gosh. Anything else? I also want to lift up uh, Pastor Lynn and Greg for their travels and renewal. They're doing kind of horse stuff right now and family stuff. So we continue to keep them in our prayers for everything that they need and continue prayers for those affected by the Yellowstone River flood. And I've got my piece of paper here as others. Um, We want to pray for Pastor Don Skerritt of Christ United who's still recovering from COVID, I saw on her Facebook, it looks like she, she kind of got clobbered a little bit with it, it sounds like. So uh, just continued prayers for healing and restoration. And it's at a very stressful time on her ministry as well, uh, picking up a new church. I also have praise and thanks to God. Um, yesterday, as you may have read the paper, there was a drag queen story hour at uh, a bookstore in Helena that had come under some threat, uh, potentially from the Oath Keepers and some other organizations. And the event went on, and many of us are good friends with members of the Mr. Sisters Strike Queen Troop here in Great Falls, and Juilliard and Virgo, and another drag goddess, Jackie, did the book, uh, Child's, the children's story reading, and it was fabulous. There was no disruption. Love over conquered evil. And I give praise for the courage of all these people who went and participated and prayed. Because I'm going to get emotional. Um, I'm just grateful for people who gauge in acts of resistance against evil in our world. And that was truly the kingdom of God yesterday in that bookshop in Helena for my, for my sermon this morning. 
uh, it's small acts of kindness, it's small acts of goodness. And I was talking to one person there, and we were discussing the threats, and he said, there's just too much love in here. There's just too much love. And it's true. It was packed with good, beautiful, loving people of the LGBT community and their allies. So I give praise to God for those acts of resistance and faith. Anything else? All righty. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let us seek, let us ask, let us know our prayers are heard. And so eternal God, we rejoice this morning in the gift of life, which you have received by your grace and the new life you give in Jesus Christ. Especially we thank you for the love of families the affection of our friends, strength and abilities to serve your purpose every day, the community of which we are a part, opportunities to give as we have received. God of grace, we offer our prayers for the needs of others and commit ourselves to serve them as we have been served in Jesus Christ. Especially we pray for those closest to us, our families, our friends, our neighbors, for refugees, for those who survive on the streets and do not have a place to call home, the outcast and persecuted, those from whom we are estranged. And hear us now, O God, as we commit our deepest concerns to you in the quiet of our hearts. And so, God of mercy, here as we pray together the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, And so now it's time for our offering. The gifts of God come generously and abundantly. We hold, nurture, and amplify them as they are entrusted to our care. We respond faithfully by sharing them for the good of the community and creation. And so in this act of faith and trust, we transform our resources of time and talent and finances into the good news of the world. This morning, you may leave your gifts at the two little buckets here at the back. One is marked for First Congregational United Church of Christ. The other is for Christ United Methodist Church. You can also go to the websites of either of those churches and click on the giving button. And as we come to worship this morning in this place called Sanctuary, we come here from what is happening in our lives and as Tyler plays, depending on how you are, take the time to reflect upon what is on your heart and mind. And if you can, if there's troubles, leave them on the altar before God. Alternatively, alternatively if you're in a place in life, there's a new great-grandson, and there's joys, offer your praise and thanksgiving to God and gratitude for God's presence in your life. So let this be a time of meditation and reflection upon the holy. And so giver, steward, and guide, may these gifts we bring magnify beyond the boundaries of our community to create new possibilities in the world.
So please stand in body or within your heart for the prayer of dedication and thanksgiving. God of abundance, you set before us a plentiful harvest, and we feast on your goodness, strengthen us to labor in your field, and equip us to bear fruit for the good of all. We have left on your altar our gifts to further your ministry. We have left that which burdens us. Renew our spirits to find healing, new perspectives, and a fresh start. Furthermore, receive our praise and thanksgiving as we remember and claim your abiding love of us, just as we are. Amen. And please stay standing as we sing our doxology, which means saying glory to God. God from whom all blessings flow. And please stay standing for the final hymn, which is going to be in the Methodist hymnal which I think is blue, number 270. And Laura is going to lead us in this rendition of the Lord's Prayer. stay standing for the benediction. Great, O God, is your kingdom, your power and your glory. Great are your works, your wonders, and your praises. Great also is your wisdom, your goodness, your justice, your mercy, and for all these we do bless you and will magnify your holy name forever and ever. Our worship is finished. Let our service begin. Amen. <laughs>